Helsinki, it's such an honor for us two to be back here on stage. And if you're surprised why this guy doesn't have a mustache and doesn't look like the founder of 11X, then uh, you're very right, because Hassan got stuck in San Francisco, so he can't be with us. But I couldn't be more excited to have this guy with us tonight, because he's one of the most successful SaaS founders we ever actually had out of Europe. Uh, more than 99% of Fortune 500 companies use his product. So a big welcome to Andre founder of Miro, and thank you so much for, for jumping in this thank session you. today. Thank you, Robert. Uh, great to be here. Hi, everyone. And it's actually only fair because we were supposed to do this session two years ago and he uh, caught COVID, so uh, it's only fair that you're jumping in. Let's jump right in. Um, I mean, Miro is a great success story today. It's doing more than half a billion in revenues. Uh, it's a global category leader in collaboration, but that hasn't been the case like since day one. Take us back to 2011 when you started Miro out of the very small city of Perm. What, what kind of guy would I have met if I met you? What, what drove you? How was your life back then? Yeah, it was a great time because uh, I was running a creative agency and I was continuously exploring what next I can do. So I was experimenting. I was uh, creating an incubator uh, to facilitate startups to grow. We ran a big conference. Uh, we were doing digital art. So I was yeah. trying to do different stuff to figure out what's my thing and what's the thing that I can built at scale and uh, yeah i was very hungry for figuring something out that can have a significant impact uh, and i was experimenting i was always trying something new that 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 who were i am and i hope i'm still that guy yeah so you were basically you didn't think about starting a software company you were following your obsession you were a creative agency and you turned that really into a software product like when did you decide to to build a software product out of a manual agency kind of it's a very different business yeah right? yeah I, I i had a friend he was professor at mit and he told me that man like creative agency is great but maybe you can do something that is scalable and repeatable and i was like what's that scalable and repeatable and i yeah. started digging and at that time SaaS was uh, on the rise and uh, i found out that this is a great opportunity to turn our creative ideas, turn some problems that we see in the industry when we collaborate with our customers remotely into a software. And um, I figured out that this scalable, repeatable business model is such, a, such an opportunity because you build something once, then you sell it to many customers across the world and you sell it multiple times. What's a great business compared mm -hmm. to the creative agency where you have a customer, you have to create an idea, you come to them, they say it doesn't work. You come back, you create an idea, come to them, it doesn't work. And then you can spend more time uh, on creating than on driving the business. So I was pretty, pretty impressed with the opportunity. So, And uh, we built uh, around this opportunity of collaborating with customers who are remote from us. Yeah. It's a great story because I think many of you are founders who want to start a company. And you know sometimes you go on TechCrunch and you say, hey, I want to build an AI company. But I think... The story of Andre impresses me in particular because it's really just following something you like doing every day, like trying to find that obsession and then really step by step turning it into a great product or great business is something that no one can take from you or copy. One amazing thing about Miro's product growth, it's something we, we don't often see in software that is that it's incredibly viral. So if we look at how fast you went from zero to now, I mean, more than half a billion in revenues and uh, more than 99% of Fortune 500 companies using you. The special thing is on the one hand side, you have a very bottom up adoption. So like consumers using it, I guess many of you guys are using it. I mean, I'm using it, many of my friends. But then you also have very enterprise sales top down, you know, like large corporations using it. Maybe you can explain a little like how this growth works or how, how what's the secret sauce behind Miro's yeah. viral growth engine? Yeah, yeah. I think it's all about the market, to be honest. Um, we were uh, starting our kind of growth experiments around 2014 and 2015. And at that time, we already saw that companies like Dropbox, Zoom, Slack uh, were building this kind of bottoms up flywheel. And uh, employees, knowledge workers in the companies were discovering new tools and they were allowed to bring those new tools into the, into the businesses. 
And we were thinking, okay, how we can build as simple as possible product that can have that flywheel. And that's why we build it around this uh, mental model of a whiteboard, which is super simple, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and we optimize the flywheel of the um, uh, viral loops. Now, in 2022, the world changed. And the world changed uh, towards very strong control of what the company is using. And CFO became one of the, uh, one of the people who is on the buyer decision com uh, committee, correct? So it's like together with a CIO, uh, together with some other people, they have to decide what the tools are allowed in the enterprise and what's not. So I met a bunch of customers, like big enterprises, and uh, they share that they have to reduce the number of tools they use by 70-80%, which is crazy. So instead of now um, products getting into the hands of the customers like uh, bottoms up, you have to build a m machine that is um, building on top of the signals and initial usage within the enterprise, but what is called sales-led growth, correct? So, and we started that journey early 2022. We understood that post-pandemic we had to build it. Mm -hmm. And we are now still on the uh, transformation of sales-led growth. We are still uh, building and experimenting with the scalable playbooks. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we started to do it early enough uh, to build that machine that can uh, create the flywheel top-down. Yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of uh, a thing. So you, you always have to understand how the market works at a certain period of time. And if the market works in a certain way, you build, um, you build a flywheel that is kind of fitting the market well. Yeah. So I, I'm looking at the market. I'm not just looking at the growth hacks. That's smart strategy. So you make all the people addicted uh, with a Miro drug, and then you, you tell the bosses. Yeah, uh, they're, they're the good guys, story. Oh, your people are using it anyway, so why don't yeah. you get a license? And, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but the, but the, the important piece is like those who are trying to build the PLG businesses, uh, the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that when people bring the product bottoms up, it's all great and people find their use cases, but people at the top of the organization, they don't really understand the value, the ROI, the story of the company, of the product, and they look at this as a kind of local solutions to the problems rather than foundational technology for their enterprises. Yeah. Yeah. So what's important is when we're building this uh, bottoms up PLG growth, we have to figure out how we are bridging the broader story to the buyer. Uh, and that's something that we were um, quite blind for a while. We didn't realize that that's an important part. Mm -hmm. So in the last couple of years, we had to build a whole muscle of telling the story to the enterprise of who we are. Mm -hmm. Because people love us at the bottom, but buyers think it's just a simple whiteboard, which is not. Like, and that's a big gap that we have to overcome as a business. It's a great insight because many founders talk about product-led growth, but it's not many companies that really managed to, to do it well. Let's talk a bit about US and Euro. Background is, you know, Hassan, who was supposed to be on stage and uh, is, is one of the, you know, very aggressive AI first companies. Uh, he made the decision right after the Series A round to shift the headquarters from Europe to the US. So it's now a San Francisco based company. And uh, Miro is a very global company, but it's headquartered in Amsterdam and, uh, and, uh, and San Francisco. So. How do you think about building a company in Europe versus US? And also, does it mean European founders, like, how do you think about European founders moving their entire headquarters that early in the life cycle to, to, to build a company? Yeah, from my experience, um, it doesn't matter where your company is incorporated, um, as long as you are maybe not public. Uh, what matters is who is working for the company and what markets you prioritize. So for us, um, from day one, uh, it was important to go after all global markets uh, where design thinking, where like product innovation is a big topic. And uh, we, as a kind of our revenue is spread between Europe and US equally. And that happened through the organic product led growth that uh, obviously was scaled when we started to hire people and sell uh, our product in the US and in Europe. Um, we have uh, around 15% of revenue that is coming from the rest of the world. Uh, Japan, Australia are also big bets mm -hmm. for us. And we are scaling just recently, opened an office in uh, Singapore as well. But, but the main point is that you have to bring people who know how to win certain markets. And obviously for me, it was no doubt that for a go-to-market, you have to bring people from the US. 
Mm. Like you have to um, build a high velocity strategic machine that knows uh, how to, to scale fast. And uh, all our go to market leaders either uh, working in the US or they were working in the US for a long, long time and they understand mm. how to scale businesses fast. Uh, on the product side, um, it's uh, different, depends. Uh, but obviously, also, we were looking for execs who know how to scale company regardless of uh, the location mm -hmm. uh, to make it a global company. So I think it's more important about like the people with this kind of experience of mm -hmm. building and scaling global companies really fast. And we mm -hmm. in certain markets like US market or some uh, key uh, European markets or mm -hmm. uh, Australia, Japan market. So that's the most important part. Um, so and I think it's less important where those people are located. We, as a company, we're on our leadership team as a remote leadership team. Um, we started this from 2016, when I hired first uh, executive in San Francisco. And it's been eight years when we meet online uh, every week. And uh, then we have off-sites uh, every quarter in person. So mm -hmm. we spend a week in person every quarter. So that's how we run it. Is yeah. it an ideal setup? I don't know. Maybe I would uh, love to have more in-person, like in faster mm -hmm. loops uh, day to day, but yeah. it also helps because we have a presence across all our hubs, yeah. the leadership we have. But that's interesting because you're basically saying uh, the company is pretty remote or functions very well remote and, and you're a massively large company. The discussion we often have in boards is like finding global talent and having that access, uh, kind of allowing people to work remote versus, you know, sitting in one office and saying, hey, okay, all the product people we hire are in Amsterdam or all the go-to-market people. How do you think about this balance? So if I get you right, you're saying you would rather yeah. try to get the best people in yeah. the world somewhere at the cost of not being in one office and building that culture rather than saying, okay, we are having hubs in certain cities yeah. and we ask the people to be there. We're experimenting on this. So I was very intentional about hub strategy because I believe that uh, people still value in-person interactions. You need yeah. hubs where you can all fly in and spend time together. So we have hubs across the world. So yeah. in the US, we have four hubs. In Europe, we have six hubs. We have 13 offices across the world. Yeah. But at the same time, there are critical roles that you want to bring best, best in class people for this role. Mm -hmm. And before, I was trying to hire people in hubs for the critical roles. And uh, recently, I gave up on that. Uh, and I start to find people who are best in class, uh, fit in the role, as long as they commit to spend time with people in hubs on a regular basis. And to be honest, like now it's working better because I don't optimize for the local talent pool or trying to push someone to move uh, into one of our local hubs and they have like families and everything. It's more about like other people committed to work um, as close uh, as they would be in the same hub. Yeah. And in some instances, I can compare. We had people who worked in the hub, and now the person who is not working in the hub for a leadership position, and the outcomes are better when the person is not working in the hub, and even not working in the same time zone, mm -hmm. the outcomes are better in certain ways. It's also yeah. about culture fit and like the, yeah. the competence that you need to bring in for certain roles. And one last question about uh, US versus Europe. How do you feel about talent? If you look at product, yeah. if you look at business, c can you find the product talent good enough in Europe to, to keep on scaling this? I think yeah. you have a big team in Berlin where you opened a product hub and uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, we have uh, big hubs in Amsterdam, Berlin and Europe and we have uh, a good amount of people who are distributed across the US for product engineering. Uh, we have a, a decent uh, representation in London as well and Yerevan in Europe for product and engineering. So what we see is the following. You obviously can see top talent everywhere in the world. That's pretty clear. Now, if you need to hire at scale, um, obviously, in the U.S., it's uh, way easier to find the talent that um, is more experienced in a way, is like, and they understand what the uh, uh, hyper growth is and like how to uh, fast scale. In Europe, I think uh, there are a lot of people who are operating with urgency, but in general, Europe is uh, more leaning towards work-life balance, <laughs> and this is a reality. It's uh, yeah. kind of. Uh, uh, it's not a big conversation in the US, it's a big, like with employees, it's a big conversation in Europe. And we understand those things, so we are trying to build it in a way where it's sustainable 
and where you have a special talent like with entrepreneurial abilities, both in Europe and US, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They operate with urgency, they operate uh, as its la last day, as if yeah. you would run out of funds tomorrow. But some people are coming to do a job nine to five, and that's fine uh, for majority of companies to be nine to five, but it's not fine for a companies who are trying to win on the global race. And for us, we're competing with the companies that are based out of the West Coast in Israel. And that's a very, very different dynamics to compete with. So we need to be honest with ourselves and people around us, like yeah. what's the type of culture, what's the type of environment Mira is. And people have to realize if it's for them and they want to yeah. kind of uh, drive that or uh, there are some other better opportunities for a work-life balance. Yeah. So hopefully the current world situation is a wake-up call to become more hungry in Europe again uh, to, to, to build back companies. Let's speak a bit about reinventing. Uh, you've reinvented Miro many times, also yourself, if you look at your skiing skills and uh, all those things, but we don't want to go into that. But you made a pretty big announcement uh, six weeks ago, turning Miro from just a collaboration space into really an innovation platform. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this strategic shift and uh, what's it yeah. all about? Yeah, yeah, that, that was a quite a big shift for us as a business. So. We introduced Innovation Workspace, uh, and we were working on uh, this for a couple years. And the difference is that Innovation Workspace is focused on accelerating the innovation within startups and bigger companies. And we brought a bunch of uh, capabilities that we didn't have before in our product. So we brought structured formats into Mira, uh, which are data tables, documents. But the idea is that you kind of go from the discovery of the problem, which a lot of people used Mira for before, like workshopping problems, discussing, defining the solutions, right to the delivery. Because before, people were like brainstorming in Mira, workshopping the problem in Mira, maybe diagramming the problem in Mira, and then they had to move outside and do like a product requirement document somewhere, or to do a, a specification, um, or to execute tasks, uh, execute the project outside of Mira. And we thought that it's not effective, it's not efficient for, for, for our customers, so we uh, allow now teams to continue on the journey in the Mira. Mm. Uh, so they can workshop the problem, and then in one click, with the power of AI, turn that into a product brief or into a retrospective summary. And then in one click with AI, turn that into a timeline. And with the one click of AI, turn that into a clickable prototype. And with the one click of AI, turn it into a set of tasks. So you move from this discovery to definition to delivery super fast, and you don't spend a lot of time mm -hmm. on like rebuilding the whole content thing in other product and uh, clicking between tabs and all that stuff. So we believe in this world of uh, innovation, like the pace of innovation. Um, you have to bring tools that accelerate your innovation life cycle and where your teams are moving super fast from the discovery to delivery and this is mm -hmm. a continuous uh, infinite loop that teams are uh, have to follow so it, it was quite a big shift like because we are moving from just being a canvas an intelligent canvas yeah. to being the whole end-to-end -end solution but the goal here is to actually uh, make our customers uh, more productive but the canvas will be a connecting tissue you mm -hmm. still can zoom out and use the canvas as an underlying technology because that's where you see the big picture of WEC. That's where you can bring people and make decisions. So that's, that's kind of the shift we made. It's quite a big product shift and you mentioned the word AI a few times and I would be super curious, you know, since you're an incumbent company now already, you're, you're more than 10 years old, you already have massive customer scale and reach. Do you see AI rather as an opportunity or as a threat? Because you have all those, you know, AI first companies that are fast moving, fast attackers. Some of them say, look, we're, we're selling work, we're not selling software anymore, and Salesforce was yesterday. H how do you feel about Miro? Is it, is it something where you say, this is the best thing that could ever happen to you? Or is it something where you say, and, and, and you're, as an incumbent, you have a lot of customer reach, versus are there other companies that start attacking Miro where? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so with AI, I think it's both opportunity and threat at the same time. And uh, if we look from the threat angle, um, we don't know. We don't know what interfaces people would use uh, tomorrow. Uh, obviously, we see a major spike in how people 
use uh, conversational UI these days, and it might stick to all of us, and we might uh, do a lot of jobs to be done in conversational UI. Yeah. Uh, so for us, uh, uh, it's important to be on top of that game. Uh, at the same time, um, it's an opportunity because uh, because uh, there are so many things that you can do with AI innovation workspace today. So how we think about this is the following. We think that we as the humans have certain knowledge and have certain skills. But AI, we call it AI sidekicks, can extend our knowledge, our competence. So think of this this way. So if you have a team of uh, engineer and designer, you may need the skills of a product manager. And AI sidekick can complement that skill. Or you are an engineer and a product manager and you need to prototype something really fast. And you can have a sidekick of the designer that works next to you and like help you prototype and think through the design. Mm -hmm. Or a sidekick of a product marketer who can help you to nail down the positioning on your landing page, correct? So I think the AI can um, extend our capabilities and uh, be a part of the team. Mm -hmm. So before you were collaborating in Mira with the humans, and now you can collaborate with humans and AI sidekicks together. And I think that's pretty powerful um, where it can go. So we see it as a big opportunity as well, and we shipped our first version of sidekicks uh, back in July. And we are constantly iterating to make it uh, something mm -hmm. big and special. So every human becomes a 10x human. <laughs> so from a, coming from AI to a 10x human, let's, uh, let's speak a little bit about your 10x journey as a, as a, as a founder. Um, has there been any early experience that shaped who you are? Yeah, I mean, I was always trying to do something. Uh, and my math teacher in school told me, One thing that I continue repeating to myself, if you don't know what to do, do something. <laughs> It's like, and this is great because sometimes you get stuck. You go through the very straightforward journey. So I, I'll give you an example. We were hiring for a chief product officer and chief technology officer. And I can't find the person like that will fit mm. our needs. And I was going through a natural path of executive search. I was... Uh, get into my network, all that stuff. Nothing worked. And then I got an opportunity to speak uh, with the CEO of the company that was considering selling. And we ended up uh, buying the company to bring CEO of that company, become a mere CPTO. <laughs> so I actually merged job from CPO and CTO <laughs> into CPTO yeah. and brought the person through an acquisition. So it's, like, it's not a, your natural path of how you would hire a senior leader in the company, but I was looking at all different opportunities that can solve yeah. the problem I'm trying to solve here. And that's what I did. And there are a lot of things that I'm doing this way. Uh, when I can't uh, solve the problem uh, in a more straightforward mm -hmm. way. So I think that's one of those, but there have been yeah. a bunch of those. I guess there are many, but if you look at the whole journey, is there any lesson you really had to learn the hard way? I mean, from the outside, it always yeah. looks like the perfect founder's journey, but we have many people here going through the journey, starting something, and it's so rough uh, yeah. with, with all the ups and downs. Yeah, I, I have those. I, I have a lot of those, obviously. <laughs> but one of those that I recently start to realize is you have to find people who are a strong culture fit with you. Because we were all kind of told or advised when you scale the company to bring in people who saw it, who know it, and who can scale it with you, correct? But I was focused on hiring for that expertise, for that scale, for that kind of uh, experience. And I actually, and obviously we we're talking about what's important for us and what's not, but. In a lot of cases, I had to adjust my ways of working, my style, my mental models to people I was bringing in instead of trying to find people with who I would operate in terms of the culture fit, yeah. same way. Yeah. Same way in terms of like, you know, nonverbal communication and you get the same outcome. Yeah. And obviously, you need people who saw some scale, you need people who learn from their experiences. But really super important thing is like the operating model, the culture uh, that is nonverbal culture. And I'm, when I realized that, and I realized that after finding a couple people with who I'm in the same rhythm, I realized that this is so, so much more powerful yeah. for me to realize 
uh, what I want to build for this company mm. and for us to move the needle for the business altogether. That's my biggest learning so far. So it's not mm. just about the experience and, and the scale and yeah. the uh, kind of uh, uh, and the kind of big company um, approach. It's all about this, uh, you know. Uh, it's good learning the, to never, you, never, never, ever compromise on compromise the people you work on with, like, whether it's co-founders yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring people who are uh, same type of uh, co-founders mindset as you yeah. are, even for executive positions. So, and this is my kind of hard requirement now for myself when I hire people in the company. I want them to have this founders mindset. Yeah. Even if they were never been founders, I need them to have that founders mindset. One last quick five seconds question. If there's one piece of advice you, you can give to founders here to start a company in Europe, what, what piece of advice would it be? Um, yeah, uh, hire people who are hungry and who want to win big time on a global scale because there are a lot of people uh, who are like that in Europe and you can find them. It's like they have to be globally hungry. They have to, they want to win. They want to kind of, you know, uh, win big time. That's super important. That's uh, a great way a to finish it. Andre, thank you so much for jumping in and uh, making this conversation happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.